Hello, Augies. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, OG for Augie. I haven't talked about power supplies in two years back in Ask Dave 17. Let's revisit them, talking about power supplies for your home station. This could be a VHF or UHF mobile rig being used as a base station, or perhaps one of the many 100 watt HF rigs. They all have one thing in common, and that is they want to see 13.8 volts of filtered DC. Beyond that, things diverge a bit. Rigs intended to work well in a mobile environment, such as in an automobile, usually specify 13.8 volts plus or minus 15 percent. And those specified for a fixed environment usually want 13.8 volts plus or minus 10 percent. Is the difference important? Well, it certainly was for me. My old Tentac Jupiter had an unusual power spec, wanting to see somewhere between 12 and 14 volts. It worked fine on my solar charged batteries. But I replaced the Jupiter with a Yesu Fox Tango DX3000, which had a plus or minus 10% spec. The FTDX3000 behaved unpredictably, particularly in the evenings. Well, as it turned out, 12 volt batteries are weird beasts, and their voltage varies quite a bit during charging and discharging. That worked okay for the Tentec but the FTDX3000 gave me trouble. In other words, it would hang at the most inconvenient times. Let's look into that a little more with this diagram, one of those shown two years ago in Ask Dave 17. The horizontal blue line is voltage, starting at 10 and going up to 16. The magical 13.8 volts is the large vertical red arrow. In magenta, we see what plus and minus 15% really means in terms of real volts from 11.7 to 15.9. So anything inside this is okay for the radio that's been so specified. Well, as it turns out, that's designed to cover the general excursion of automobile battery voltage. An automobile battery usually doesn't go below 12 volts, except during engine start, where it can go way below. That's why you always start the ignition before turning on your radio, so the radio doesn't see that low dip. Now, during charging, the battery voltage can go well above 14 volts, sometimes even 15 volts or a bit higher. So, radios designed to work in a mobile environment such as your UHF and VHF so-called mobile rigs, must cover the entire range. And 13.8 plus or minus 15% handles it all very nicely. By the way, that's where 13.8 volts comes from in the first place. It sits nicely athwart the normal automobile voltage excursions. A radio not designed to be used in a mobile environment can be more fussy, and often are, especially since tightly controlled 13.8 volt power supplies are so readily available. To get more performance out of the radio, they are often specified as 13.8 volts plus or minus 10%. Well, now that goes down only to 12.4 volts. If you feed your radio with batteries, such as are in my photovoltaic system, the battery voltage drops to 12 volts when the batteries are 50% discharged. That's below the low limit of 12.4 volts. I didn't think anything of it at first, but noticed my FTDX3000 would lock up fairly often, particularly during the evening when the batteries weren't being charged by the sun anymore. I thought and thought about this, then drew the diagram you're looking at, and had my aha moment. I had to raise the voltage if I wanted to continue the 3000 on solar. I'm hardly the only person who has this problem. I needed a voltage booster. There are two major ones that I know of on the market, the MFJ4416 and the TGE N8XJK, 
and they're both booster type regulators. Both added enough to the input voltage to put out a nice steady 13.8 volts DC. I purchased the TGE model quite some time ago. Our club, however, has the MFJ model in the club's emergency deployment trailer. Both work wonderfully. My 3000 is now super reliable and during our club field day, our 20 meter station works well on the battery, particularly during the day when the sun shines on the club's solar panel. Okay, that's nice, but most people don't run their rigs from batteries. It is, of course, a perfectly viable option for the various mobile rigs used in your fixed station, as long as you keep the battery charged. But most people use an ordinary ham radio power supply that puts out 13.8 volts DC. Now there are many of these available, but a word of caution. Purchase a supply that's specifically made for ham radio. Cheaper supplies put out a great deal of electrical noise that can blot out the signals you want to receive. Okay, let's back up a step. There are two kinds of power supplies available on the amateur market, linear and switching. The first to come along were the linear power supplies. They have the virtue of being quiet, both physically and electrically. They have very simple designs. On the other hand, they tend to be big and heavy because they contain a large transformer. They're available in many different capacities. For a 50 watt mobile rig, you want at least a 10 amp model and for HF rigs, you want a 20 amp model. The newer rigs are more computerized, so require more current, usually by an amp or two, so often a 25 amp power supply is recommended. The other kind of power supplies, which are switching, have been in the amateur market for decades. Our mature designs and the ones for ham radio, such as PowerWorks, MFJ, and others, are perfectly suitable. They have the virtue of being less expensive and much, much lighter than linear power supplies because they don't need that big transformer. Instead, they have lots more circuitry that basically switches on the voltage from the main supply when, it, when the output voltage gets too low, then switch off the main supply when the output voltage gets too high, and does this very rapidly. This is filtered to remove the switching transients, and the result is nice, smooth DC. Note that where the cheaper ones fail is in the filtering to remove the switching transients, so make sure to get one made for ham radio. Oh, and one other thing. Most switching power supplies have an internal fan to keep them cool. Ideally, the fan only comes on when it's needed, but in some models, it's on all the time. If the fan is too loud and is on all the time, it can get annoying. These days, the linear power supplies are considered obsolete and the switching supplies are certainly acceptable as amateur best practice. However, many people like the linear power supplies and they are still widely available. The big name in linear supplies is Astron. I used to have one of their R35s. There's nothing wrong with either type, linear or switching. Now there are a couple other features to talk about. Some power supplies are sold with meters. If there are meters, the first will be for voltage, and if a second is present, it will be for the current. And some power supplies have variable output voltages. I've always been a little wary of this because it's easy to bump the knob and set the wrong voltage. Usually, there is a detent for 13.8 volts. Here's an MFJ switching supply, the MFJ4225MV. It has both a voltmeter and an ammeter. During operation, the voltmeter doesn't move around much, but the ammeter sure does. The meters are what could be called eye candy. They don't serve any useful purpose in normal operations, but are fun to watch while you talk. I admit I have a weakness for dancing needles. 
Here's a bare bones switching power supply from PowerWorks, the SS30DV. This model has been for sale for years. It has only the one light to tell you that it's on, but otherwise it just sits there and works. It's pretty inexpensive and rugged. If you want a good power supply for a 100 watt HF station, this supply works well. In fact, even on the high-end Elecraft site, they sell this particular power supply. Now, here's a truly huge 12-volt power supply designed by MFJ to drive the Ameritron ALS500M 500-watt single sideband amplifier. This switching power supply puts out 75 amps. That's a huge amount of current at 12 volts. And the ALS500M is rather unique as a power amp that uses 12 volts. And that's because the amp is designed for mobile use where a nominal 12 volts is all that is available. If you use it in an automobile, you must use enormous cables connected directly to the battery. Even here at home, the manual says the wire should not be more than four feet long. Here's an interesting thing about this supply and how well mated it is to the amplifier. The amp is designed to operate in a car. And as we noted earlier, the car voltage can go up over 15 volts. So the amp is rated to accept up to 16 volts. Interestingly, the power supply has the usual detent at 13.8 volts, but if turned all the way up, it provides 16 volts at the full 75 amps, thus allowing the amplifier to provide maximum output. This is the only instance I know of where the variable uh, voltage supply comes in handy. Okay, so bottom line, a great power supply for just about any 100 watt radio on the market today is this PowerWorks. It's pretty inexpensive. You don't have to pay double this price for the house brand power supplies from Yesu, Kenwood, and ICOM. The PowerWorks supply works just fine. Meters are optional. Beware of the variable voltage output to make sure it's 13.8 volts unless you have a specific need otherwise. There are special purpose switching power supplies for other voltages, such as the 50 or 75 volts needed for some solid state amplifiers. Usually, these supplies are purchased with the amplifier in a package deal. Older equipment using vacuum tubes are a whole nother ballgame completely different. Beware of these, for the old tube equipment requires high voltages that are quite lethal. You should really know what you're doing before you use these and be extremely careful, even to the point of keeping one hand in your pocket and using rubber mats and being very careful to bleed off all the charge from the filter capacitors. It's a whole different ballgame. Read your equipment manual thoroughly. Comply with the specifications, which are almost always for 13.8 volts DC. Note, you can power more than one device from a single power supply, such as an HF rig and a VHF rig. Since you will rarely, if ever, be transmitting on both at the same time, a single 25 amp power supply can take care of both. If you are going to use a battery as part of your power strategy, note that 13.8 volts is too high for lead acid battery float voltage, plus when the battery has become discharged, the voltage is too low to complete the absorption charging phase. There are products out there that can successfully incorporate that battery into the system if you wish, but that don't do it directly. Take a look at the West Mountain Radio Epic Power Gate systems. There are multiple ways to connect the 12 volt power supply to the radio. New radios always come with a power cable. Usually the end you connect to the power supply consists simply of stripped stranded wire. 
At a minimum, you will want to tin these with solder, which will make them ever so much easier to deal with. Or you can attach ring connectors. A popular method is to use Anderson power pole connectors with black being negative and red being positive. Note this is different from the normal house wiring color codes. The power cables themselves are usually connected to the radio with special Molex connectors that lock in place so they can't be yanked out accidentally. The power pole connectors don't lock in place. Remember to turn the power supply on before turning on the radio and turn the radio off before turning off the power supply. This helps shield your radio from any transients that occur during the power supply power up or power down. I hope this has been helpful. We've talked about much of the jargon associated with power supplies. This is a part of your station for which you need to make good choices but a reliable supply such as the PowerWorks is not expensive. In channel news, Augies can gather on Saturday mornings at noon American East Coast time or 1500 UTC for some Morse code practice via YouTube live feed. Make sure you get notice of this by becoming an Augie by subscribing to this channel and once you're subscribed, clicking the bell. If you want to go directly to the live stream, the link is www.youtube.com slash user slash Dave Kassler, D-A-V-E-C-A-S-L-E-R slash live. And note that's not David, it's Dave. Also, please check out dkassler.com slash support. Via that page, you can find the tip jar, my Patreon page, the amateur extra videos on a thumb drive, and a list of Amazon links that will give the channel a bit of a finder's fee at no additional cost to you. I am very grateful for all that you Augies do to support this channel. Today's Colorado photo was taken by my DJI Spark Drone about 200 feet directly above our home. You can see we live in the boonies. Remember to use both feet when walking. Until we next meet, I love all you Augies and 73. I'm learning more about digital mobile radio or DMR. Hopefully, I'll soon learn enough to make a video. Oh,